Lord, help me show others your love and your mercy. Make my life a witness to others, I pray. In a little white church house at an old tear-stained altar, a prayer for God's mercy was heard. No, his sins were many and his burden heavy. He took the Lord at his word. Now the angels rejoiced as he was forgiven. For shouts filled the temple that day. I never get over that trip to the altar. I was that sinner who prayed. Thank God for the preacher who told me of Jesus. I'd be a beggar if not for his grace. Lord, help me show others your love and your mercy. Make my life a witness to others, I pray. I thank God for the preacher who told me of Jesus. I'd be a beggar if not for his grace. Lord, help me show others your love and your mercy. Make my life a witness to others, I pray. Make my life a witness. To others I
Good morning. morning. Welcome to New Haven Baptist Church this morning. Great to see everyone out today. Uh, We're filling up slowly around here. Smiles all around looking back this way. I've got a few announcements for you. Gentlemen, I need about 10 minutes of your time after service this morning, if you could. Come down to the fellowship hall. We need to get some tables and chairs up so we can uh, get the floor cleaned up. Uh, We've got things coming, uh, approaching soon that we need to get prepared for. One of which, if you looked at your bulletin, was our 9-11 service. Uh, Read about that. We've scheduled it. It's about six weeks away. If you want to help, be part of, give a phone call to the church office. I'll guarantee you we can find something for you to be involved in that day, something for you to do. Uh, God's leading you to help, and volunteers are needed and asked for. Uh, So be part of that as it approaches. Uh, Other announcements include... Uh, five o'clock this evening, deacons meeting here at the church. Brother John, you're going to have choir practice yep. this evening. Choir practice following service this evening. We are having service at six o'clock. Come back, be part of that tonight. We'll worship together, uh, and we'll praise the Lord as we do so, just like we're going to do this morning. Uh, so lots of great things going on. I'll ask that our ushers come this morning, that we will receive this morning's offering. And let's keep Brother Wayne Chitwood in our prayers this week. Continue to remember him. But more importantly, let's, let's remember Christ and what he's done for us and, and what he's going to continue to do and to lift up those that are lost. Brother James has got more to talk about on that today. Uh, join me in prayer this morning. Father, we're so thankful that you've come to us, that you've reached down, that you've called us to be one of your own, and that we were able to accept your gift of salvation through Jesus Christ and have eternal life. Father, we pray that that gift continues to go out, to be spread, that others, their hearts and their are pierced and reach for you and call upon the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for one another here in the church as you'll continue to strengthen us, provide for us as we go through our day to day. Father, I pray for Brother Wayne this morning as you continue to work on him. Father, heal his body, bring him back to be a continued blessed vessel for you here in this church. Father, I take time to pray this morning over the service that you'll use it in a mighty way. And as we take time to give back to thee from the tithes of tithes and offerings that you've given to us, we ask that you bless them, multiply them, that thy name may run, ring true in this community and throughout the world. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Jesus anytime. You know, the Bible says, for those who shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I'm hoping that if you've not called on his name today, that you'd call on his name. But maybe you need to call on him. Maybe you've not called on him in a while, and then you know him. So let's make it right today, folks. Let's all stand up. Turn around. Welcome each other. Let's worship together today. Folks, just sing holy, holy, holy today about it. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Early in the morning my song shall rise to thee. Holy, holy. and mighty God in three persons blessed trinity let's sing holy 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 all the saints adore thee casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee which word and art and evermore shall be holy Holy, holy, though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. Only thou art holy, there is none beside thee. Perfect in power, in love, in purity. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name. In earth and sky and sea Holy, holy, holy Merciful and mighty God in three persons Blessed Trinity Sorry. 
I had my mind on what we were going to do next other than this. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to Him we give. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of lords who is the great I am. You may be seated. Found a bit. 
pieces But he made me whole I brought to him nothing But still he gave me everything He found a beggar And I found a king Yes, I'm the beggar Lord, you're my king. Numbers. We live by numbers. We track and count and measure everything, and sometimes, we think the only numbers that really matter are the big ones. But it's the single digits that make the difference. The Bible says that heaven rejoices with the number one. Yeah, heaven rejoices each time even one person comes to know Jesus. We pastors dream about big numbers, and we should. But a daily focus on one meaningful interaction for Christ, that's the true difference maker. One friend, one family member, one coworker, one person at a time. We want to see God move in our nation like we have never seen before, but it all starts with one. I've got my one, and now I'm challenging you and your church to join us and to find yours. Because ultimately, the only number that really matters is one. Who's your one? Amen and amen. God is good, amen? Hallelujah. I'm glad that God took a beggar. <laughs> Aren't you? I'm glad that I was somebody's one. Amen. I'm glad somebody cared about me. I told our class this morning, I'm glad somebody invested in me. And uh, I still ain't much, but I ain't what I used to be. Amen. And because of God's grace and his love and his mercy, neither are you. I want to challenge you today to be praying about and thinking about who's your one, who's that one. We are kicking off today through August. We're going to be talking about who's your one. I'm excited about this because I think it has the right focus. Church, I'll be honest with you, I don't do a whole lot of these things like this. I, we get promo stuff constantly in the office. This one just really grabbed hold of me and... Uh, because it's such an evangelistic outreach. And I want you to, to get on board with this thing. Because that's, listen, there's a lot of beggars out there. Amen. And God wants them. He, the Bible says that it's not his will that any should perish. Is that the word? Amen. But that all should come to a saving knowledge. And so, man, we have a obligation. Now, I'm going to tell you, I've checked my motive on this stuff. Because I have to do that. Because I'm human like you. And if, if my motive would have been anything other than to see lost people saved, we wouldn't be doing this. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. The only motive, it's not to grow our church, even though if that comes, praise the Lord, but it's to grow the kingdom. It's not to grow my ego. I don't need any help doing that. I can do that all on my own. Amen. But it's to grow the kingdom. It's to get lost people saved. It's to see God impact one. It's amazing what God can do if that one gets impacted. The entire family is impacted. You know that? Uh, it's amazing. And so I want you to be praying about it. I want you to be thinking about it. I'm going to ask you this question right now. Who's your one? Who's that one that God put on your heart? Some of you already know. Some of you already been praying. Some of you already have been thinking about it. We're not asking who's the 50, who's the 100, who's the one? Because ultimately that's the number that's going to matter is who's your one? Who has God put on your heart to win for the cause of Christ? I want you to turn with me in your Bible this morning to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Matthew chapter number 4. And we're going to read just about uh, four or five verses there in the book of Matthew. Um, pay close attention to uh, what Christ is doing here in calling out disciples and making disciples in Matthew chapter 4. It's familiar to you, uh, verse 18 through 
uh, verse number 22. Here's what the Word of God said. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from hence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother in a ship with Zebedee his father, mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Lord, I pray today that you would bless the reading of your word. I believe with all my heart, God, your word tells us that it's not going to return void God I pray that this morning that hearts would already be prepared and be open to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ I pray for Christians today to begin uh, searching and seeking out maybe we have folk here today who has never won anybody for the cause of Christ and I pray today God that Maybe this will be a point in their life where they begin to realize and understand that you saved them and you saved us for a purpose. And that purpose is to go into all the world and preach the gospel, to proclaim to every creature and every nation this blessed truth of Jesus saves. And maybe, God, you've already got that one on somebody's heart today. That's their one that in the coming days and the weeks and the months that that God that's the one that they need to focus their prayer life on that's the one they need to focus their invitations on and their investment on I pray today God that you would help us to realize that begin to burden our hearts that we not just talk to them God we pray for them God we invite them God we we take the time to make that investment we're going to love you and praise you we're going to We're going to serve you, God, because that's what you called us to do. Help us now today. Anoint our minds in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. On earth as it is in heaven. When I say things like um, for you to think about maybe a politician or or I say um, uh, the word movie star or sports hero, Immediately, something comes to your mind. If I say a millennial, you, you think about a millennial, maybe one in particular. Odds are you, you've got uh, certain mental associations with each one of them. Now, when you hear the word Christian, what comes to mind? When somebody starts talking to you about a real Christian, do you know one? Is there somebody in your mind when you think about what a Christian is or when the word Christian is mentioned, you automatically go to that one person? I do. Actually, I probably have several of them. I associate the word with certain characteristics. And the broader culture also forms impressions of what a Christian is and whether or not they are one. The first followers of Jesus didn't call themselves Christians. It was, I told the class this morning, it was a derogatory term. If they seen somebody and they knew they were a follower of Christ, they go, man, he's a Christian. That's, that's, that, that was derogatory. It, it didn't, didn't, it wasn't something to be proud of. Think about that. Um, I find it very interesting as I was studying and reading and getting ready, I learned something that I didn't know. Uh, I always learn a lot I don't know a lot of times but you know how many times in the Bible the word Christian is mentioned three isn't that amazing because we throw it around a lot right as much as we talk about Christianity and Christians and what a Christian is the Bible only mentions Christians three times by name Christian the word Christian three times in the Bible but do you know how many times the word disciple is in the Bible 281 now Before I act like somebody, I didn't count all that. I don't have that kind of patience. But somebody done the work for us, all right? But I thought that was amazing that the word Christian's only mentioned three times, but the word disciple is mentioned some 281 times. That's quite a bit. I thought about the Christians, 
They, the first Christians, they were known as disciples. That word Christian is only used three times in the Bible. Disciple is a far more accurate and compelling description of what it means to follow Jesus. And we'll see, as we'll see, the concept of a disciple exposes the fact that many who claim to be Christians are not actually disciples of Christ. That's why when you go out here uh, in Oneida and you're walking down the street and you ask someone, are you a Christian? Most of them's response, overwhelmingly, is going to be what? Yes. Right? Did you know that like 80% of uh, American, uh, Americans call themselves Christians or associate with cr the Christian faith? That's amazing to me. But there's a difference in those associating as Christians. A lot of people are Christians. Why? Well, because Papa was. Amen? Because, because Dad was a Christian or Mom was a Christian. So therefore, I am a Christian. You go to the hospital. Now they don't ask you just what denomination you are. Are you a Christian or not? Yes or no? It's a yes or no. Yes. Okay, Christian, check. Check that one off. But just because you are a Christian doesn't make you a disciple. <laughs> a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that concept of a disciple, that exposes that fact. See, as Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee, we saw here in our scripture, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and his brother Andrew, and they were casting a net into the sea because they were fishermen. And he looks at them and he says, follow me. And if you follow me, and I'm adding a little bit to it here, this is my words, I'm going to make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And then going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, and they were preparing the nets. And he called them and they left the boat and their father and they followed him. I thought about it. Let me ask you a question. You work for your dad. Okay? Okay. Anybody here ever work for their dad? Toughest job in the world. I don't even care what you were doing. <laughs> if you're working for your dad, it's hard. Dads expect more from sons or daughters. And so it's a tough job. Was your dad ever critical of you? You don't have to answer that. I certainly don't want Brett to answer that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amen to that. Dads ask questions like, are you a complete dummy? I don't want Harley to answer that. Actually, yesterday I said to Harley, are you a complete dummy? <laughs> and Brett's sitting there, and he goes, man, if I had a dollar every time I heard that. <laughs> Some of the older can teach the younger, right? Dads are hard to work for, especially if you're their kids. Now, get a load of this. Simon, Peter, Andrew, they're fishermen. I got a feeling fishermen were pretty salty, <laughs> pun intended. I can't help it. It comes with the territory. They maybe had a little bit of language issues, and I just imagine that now. I'm not saying it's true. This is just me talking. Could you imagine some guy comes walking along the coast in his flowing gown and his beard and his flowing locks, and he just looks out there to total strangers, and he said, follow me, and I'm going to make you fish for people. What do you think, Peter? Sounds good to me. They go follow Jesus. What about dad? I bet dad thought that was a great idea, huh? <laughs> and then he finds two more. And he says, follow me. And they did. Now, I want to ask you, I'm going to take a poll right here real quick. How many in this room thinks, that's a strange thing, raise your hand. How many of you think, nah, not a big deal? How many of you wouldn't raise your hand if I was giving away $100? <laughs> You're not voting for anybody when you do that, by the way. We're a Baptist church. <laughs> You'll get that tomorrow, and it'll... Never mind. <laughs> I find that strange, man. I think that's kind of... I mean, if that was my boy, I'd be like, where are you going, boy? You Get your behind back here. 
And then I'd go have a little talk with this guy strolling down calling people to follow him. <laughs> hey, you didn't feed them. You didn't raise them. You, you know what I mean? We're just humans here. I'm just talking. But they immediately, they dropped everything and they followed Jesus. Wow. <laughs> now, On the initial reading of this, then I have a problem. But then I, I get to thinking about the historical background. And you think about that all the Hebrew boys went to Torah, a school starting at age five. And, and what they did there, and this is all of them, is they studied, they studied the Torah or the first five books, if you will, of the Old Testament. And the best students went on to study the remainder of the Old Testament and the the rest of them returned home. But they studied for five years, and at age 10, they could tell which one of them was going to be the ones that were really getting it, if you will. And they, Their goal at about age 17, if a boy wanted to go on and make a career out of religious studies, the next step was to find a rabbi that he admired and apply to become one of his disciples, a Talmudim, if you will. He wanted to be... Uh, when he found one, he'd go and he'd sit at his feet. And, and when he sat at his feet, that's kind of a, was a request to learn. And the rabbi would examine him with questions and put him through a series of tests to see if he was worthy to be his disciple. And the rabbis could choose the smartest, most talented boys to be their disciples. There's another reason that the rabbis were so picky is that when they chose a disciple, they were choosing someone whom they believed could become just like them. To not just know what they knew, but to do what they did. And so, for several years, these young disciples would follow their rabbis, and they would imitate them in every way. And the goal of a disciple was to be like the rabbi. When someone would see these young men, they would say, you've got the dust of your rabbi on you. And that was a great honor, because that meant... You look like him, you smell like him, you sound like him, and, and, and what a goal that was of these young boys. Now, when I think about that, and the Bible doesn't say this, but listen, Jesus, Jesus had already, since age 12 when he'd been teaching, he already had some fame. Word had spread a little bit. I don't know if they knew Jesus or not, but it would make more sense to me is if they knew who this was. Because, again, at this point, they don't know that he's the son of God. Maybe he just got the, 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 you know, the notion of being a great rabbi. I don't know that, and I'm not saying that's what it is, but it would make more sense, right? And, and now here's an opportunity for these boys that's working as fishermen to possibly sit at the feet of this great rabbi. Again, I don't know if that's exactly true. Uh, they didn't teach that back in Spring Creek where I came from. <laughs> But it would make a whole lot more sense to me if that were the case. But there's a whole lot we need to see here. And if you're taking those, I want you to write this down, all right? I want you to write down this, this idea of, of being a disciple of Christ and what that means. And, 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 and I talked to our class a little bit this morning. It kind of spilled over into our class time. We've been discussing discipleship for a couple of weeks now. And this kind of spilled out a little bit. But I thought about this passage and, this, and, and, and the outline and... and if you look at this, number one, Jesus doesn't choose the best. Again, he's choosing fishermen here. He chooses the willing. Now, I want you to see this. Whereas this, in the historical sense, I said it makes sense to me. He, 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 he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and his brother Andrew, cast a nest in the sea. And the Bible, it goes out of its way to tell us, for they were fishermen. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus, this new rabbi, if you will, chooses Peter and Andrew who are fishermen. The fact that they're fishermen shows you what? What does that tell us? The fact they're fishermen tells me that maybe Jesus wasn't interested in the A team. He is okay with the B team. Jesus chose fishermen. I want you to let that sink in just a minute. When Jesus chose his squad to build the movement that God had sent him here, he, listen, he, he didn't choose some that we might think. The rabbi had chosen them guys, maybe those without much potential 
or personal power. <laughs> he, he chose those that would become like him to know God like he knew God, to know what he knew to do, what he did, and to be filled with his power. John MacArthur wrote a book, God Skipped All the Wise of the Day. He said this, the great scholars were in Egypt, the great library was in Alexandria, the great philosophers were in Athens, the powerful were in Rome, and he passed over Herodias, the historian, and Socrates, the great thinker, and Julius Caesar, and he chose men so ordinary that it was comical. No rabbi, no teachers, no, listen, that's when I heard that song this morning again, I'm glad that God doesn't, he doesn't choose the qualified. We say it all the time. He, he, he qualifies those that he chooses. Amen. And God gets to make that decision, not James and not you, not the church. <laughs> the Baptist church, that is. Some churches make that decision. But I'm glad that God chose us. He chooses those that he wants to use because I believe his work in the world wouldn't come from their ability for him, but for, from him he would do through. Listen, I have no ability today to be a preacher or a pastor. That's, I, 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 sometimes I think probably fishermen would have been a good choice for me. Amen. Where I grew up, how I grew up, and, and I'm still, I ain't nothing. When I talk about myself, I want you to understand, nobody knows me better than me, so that's the reason I don't talk about you. I really don't know who you are, but I really know who I am, and I know this about me. I'm so flawed. Are you listening? I'm so flawed that only God could use me <laughs> because the world wouldn't choose me, period. Now, that's where I feel like we are today. That's where I feel like I am. And so when God chose to use me, I'm glad that God chooses some from the B team because I never was on an A team anywhere. And the reason he done that, because God knows I have no ability. It's something really funny I was thinking about as I was studying this message. You know, when I first got married, I didn't own a tie. Much less know how to tie one. <laughs> my wife bought me my first tie. What color it was? Pink. <laughs> now, where I come from, we weren't real secure, amen. <laughs> boys wore, what color do the boys wear? They wear blue. What color do the girls wear? Pink. <laughs> my daddy had already hurt my feelings with the whole earring thing, so I was already feeling a little bit. My wife goes and buys me a pink tie. I said, what do you want me to do with that? She said, wear it. I said, for what? She said, we're having pictures made. I said, I don't have a shirt. Guess what else she bought me? Shirt. You know what color it was? Pink. pink. Got a picture of it, do we not? I got on a pink tie with little doodads on it and a pink shirt. Now, this story would be great if I told you I had a pair of pink pants, but I didn't. <laughs> no way, Jose. I had the prettiest pink shirt, the prettiest pink tie with a pair of blue jeans. <laughs> Why do you say that? Because, I listen, number one, I, I didn't have the ability to even tie a tie. It's kind of funny. I, I was very insecure, not just in colors, but I was insecure in everything. And for me to get up and speak in front of a bunch of short-haired people that look like business people, that scared me to death. Y'all were weird to me. <laughs> Somebody agrees. Hallelujah. <laughs> Quite honestly, some of you still are. <laughs> I better move along. I'm getting in the flesh. Listen, people with a lot of talent and a lot of ability would only get in the way because they'd never learned to lean on him. I'm telling you, we better be watching out for people like that. <laughs> Jesus taught that his, that his power in the weakness, in the weakest vessel was infinitely greater than the greatest talent without him. In other words, church, listen to me. I'd rather have the power of God in a vessel that's beaten broken, battered, and scarred, who has no ability to win anybody than to have the scholar. Amen. Because God will take that one and use them. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't use scholars or smart people or rich people. I'm just saying at this time right here, Jesus wants to show us that he'll take nothing, just a bunch of old clay, 
and he'll make something beautiful out of them. You and I can't do that. Oh, we can disciple, we can be a part of it, but we can't do it. Listen, God wants to use you. He wants to use your family. Everywhere you go, at your workplace, at the schoolhouse, at the church house, at the courthouse, and our job is to stop making excuses that we're not able. He doesn't need our ability, but he requires our availability. We must say, Lord, what did Isaiah say? Here am I, Lord. Send me. God, show me my one. Not I, and I've already heard it, preacher. You just don't understand. I don't talk in front of people. <laughs> what am I? You talk in front of me, right? I'm a people. Listen to me. God's not. God's not wanting your ability to speak to people. If God was looking for ability, He'd have never chose Moses. Give me an amen. Because Moses couldn't talk without stuttering. He had an issue. If God was looking for ability, He wouldn't have chosen a bunch of fishermen. Are you kidding me? God. Now, don't get me wrong. He chose Luke. The physician, God chose smart men, so don't get me wrong, but I'm saying God didn't call you just because you don't have any ability in your mind. God, God doesn't call anybody, but God will use those that are humble in spirit. God, who's my one? God, who's the one that I need to get to you? I had somebody say to me, preacher, I tell you what, I, I like this campaign, but I tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to get them to come to church, and I'm going to let you get them. And I said, I'll take your one, praise God. You get them there, man. I'll go after them, right? But really, this is about you winning one. Let me tell you what happens when you win one. First time I ever won a kid in my life on the back of a school bus in between Hot Springs and Marshall, North Carolina. Kid prayed through on a morning. Tell me how spiritual he was. Huh? He was ready. I'd been talking to him in the evening, come to school the next morning, got on school bus. We had a 45-minute ride to school across two little mountains. He accepted Jesus somewhere between Hot Springs and Marshall. Man, I was fired up. Y'all might have a hard time believing this, but my freshman year in high school, I was four foot ten and weighed ninety five pounds. <laughs> Ferocious. <laughs> Biggest guy there. I'm gonna name names today. Na guy named Robbie Riddle, seven foot two, center for the worst football team in the history of the world. When I got to school that morning, I walked up to Robbie Riddles, and I stared him right in his knees. And I said, Robbie, hello, Smurf. That's what they call me, Smurf. Hello, Smurf. Y'all try that now, bless God. <laughs> that was one of my more desirable nicknames. What are you doing? I said, Robbie, I got one thing to say to you. He said, what's that? I said, Jesus loves you, man. He said, Smurf, you went and got religion? I said, no. But an old boy named Randall Presnell, I, on the way to school this morning on the back of the bus, I've been telling him that for weeks, and this morning he accepted Jesus, and I want you to know, man, that he loves you, and he'll save you if you'll ask him to. I wish I could tell you Robbie got saved then, but he didn't. <laughs> he said, I'll take it under consideration <laughs> or something like that. But I was 10 feet tall and bulletproof then. What are you saying? If you'll win one, you'll win two. It's contagious. If you ever get that one, I'm telling you. But right now we're concentrating on one. And by the way, a few years later I was an evangelist. Set up a big tent on the school grounds that I grew up on. Put up a big tent. Had a, had a two-week tent revival meeting that I preached. Me and one of my buddies just... Just wanted to do something at home. I wanted to go home again and show that crowd that I wasn't just some drunk's kid. That God saved me with no ability and called me into ministry. And we went back and preached. And guess what? That old boy, I went on the back of the bus. You remember this mama, Randall Presnell? I was up one night preaching. Old boy run up and grabbed me. Big old guy. Pinned my arms next to me. Started dancing around on the altar thanking me for getting to Jesus. <laughs> then he kissed me. I'm a germaphobic, just so y'all know. God had to help me with that. He hadn't quite got me there at that point. Here's my point. You need to win one. Who is it? Listen to me. God chooses us. He chose us. 
Jesus doesn't choose the best. He chooses the willing. He chose us, not we him. Follow me, he told them. I explained the normal way this all went down is that if you were among the best of your class, you applied to a rabbi, and if he liked what he saw, he'd choose you back. Now, his selection gave them a great deal of confidence. If they were struggling, they could say, man, my rabbi believed in me. He chose me. But see, Jesus started the process back even further. They didn't have to come to sit at his feet because he came seeking them when they weren't even looking. <laughs> my, my, my. See, some of you are struggling now in your marriage, your career, your parenting. If you belong to Jesus and you're his disciple, you're worth something. I don't care how you're struggling right now. He chose you. I couldn't get to him and neither could you. Why? He's too holy. He chose me. I know I'm somebody. Why? Because God chose me. Jesus chose me. See, I didn't, I didn't choose him. I didn't choose. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Jesus, Jesus I appointed you to go and produce fruit and that your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask in the Father's name, you ask the Father in my name, he'll give to you, John 15, 16. He chose us. That ought to humble all of us today, amen? Jesus chose us. We're worth something to him. Number three, our primary calling is to be with him. I want you to get that. I got to hurry up, man. I'm running out of time today. Listen to me. Follow me, he told them. He didn't tell them where they were going. They, he, he didn't tell them what their assignment was that he had for them. His call was to do was, was not to do something, but it's to become like him. To become like him, you have to know him. To know him, you have to know his word. You, you, you've got a lot of outlets out here today for this weekly message. We've got a lot of things going on, Sunday school. We've got Bible studies and all of that. And Listen, if we're really serious about being his disciples, you, you'll take advantage of some of these. We, we'll get in his word. We, listen, we'll get inside of his word until it dominates our thinking and all of our behavior until we think and talk and quote it. That's our primary calling is to be with him. Number four, to follow him. We've got to leave it all. Look at the Bible said immediately they left the boat and their father and they followed him. I wonder why he identified those two things. I think because they're usually the most two significant things in our lives. Boat, our careers, the way we take care of ourselves. Father, our most significant relationships. To follow Jesus, he has, listen to me, he has to take precedence. My job's important. Being your pastor is important. But more important than that is being a disciple of his. I'm to follow him. Amen. You're not to follow your preacher. That's why churches fall apart all the time. Listen, I'd like to think when I'm gone, you guys will just keep on coming. Amen. <laughs> Here's the fact of things, folks. We live in the 21st century. This is a Southern Baptist church. Preachers come and go do this. It's important that you understand you're not following a man. You're following Christ. <laughs> Isn't that good? If I was following men, they've let me down. I'm following him. Listen, we got to leave it all to follow Jesus. He has to take precedent over everything. Most of us won't literally lose our father and mother over Jesus. And For some, God might tell you to change careers, and maybe God will tell you to transfer your job to be a part of a church plan or leave your job to carry out the gospel overseas and be a missionary. But for many of us, it probably won't be that dramatic, but you'll have moments where you decide which holds greater, greater sway over your life. I want to pull up emergency brake and preach for two hours here, but I can't because time's leaving us. We need to get refocused on what it means to be a disciple of Christ and whatever God tells us to do, to do it. And then he commands for us to spiritually reproduce. He said, follow me. I'm going to close with this. He told them, and I'll make you fishers of men or I'll make you fish for people. Following Jesus means you subject everything in your life to his lordship. You forsake all that he's forbidden and pursue all that he's prescribed. Jesus 
just like he was a fisher of men, his followers would become fishers of men. That's an essential part of being a disciple. It's not something that just a few of us do or the preacher does or the Sunday school teacher does. It's something that each of us does. There's no such thing as a non-reproducing Christian. That's why this is so important. How do you prove you're a disciple? By bearing fruit. And if you're not bearing fruit, you've got reason to question whether you're a disciple. You see where we started? Christian disciple? Are you a Christian? Are you a disciple of Christ? If so, who's your one? Where are we going to start at? Who's your one? Who's my, I, I thought about that. I thought about I'm going to close with this. I got, a, I got a quick little story. And if you have to go, I understand. But I want you to get this, okay? I thought about how many ones have I had in my life. You ever thought about that? Since I became a disciple of Christ, since I was saved... How many times have I had the opportunity to win the one? I have counted in my head about six ones that I will never have an opportunity to win again. That's something. I never forget maybe the first one that God ever just impressed on me was a young lady. And I'm going to name names today because this is family. And again, I know me. So I have to talk about me. And sometimes it hurts. And this one hurts. Vicki Childs was my first cousin. We played in the sandbox together. One of my first memories is of, of she and I, we were about the same age. My mom and her mom were sisters. Was in a little sandbox playing cars with this little girl. <laughs> I don't have a whole lot of memory other than that. Now I remember as we got older, we became teenagers and she kind of got a little wilder and so did I. And, but we were wild together in a lot of ways. Some of y'all have family like that, right? They were like your best friend. First cousins are our original best friends anyway. She was my best friend. We used to sneak around and smoke Winston's together. <laughs> That's how tight we were. And we never told on each other. We got a little bit older and Vicky went one way and the Lord saved me and I was adopted by a Baptist preacher. Vicky was a teenage runaway. She ran away, went to Florida, got married, came home. Divorced the guy a year later. We got back in contact together. I ended up getting married. Didn't have any kids. Vicky went the other way. She became, I'm trying to figure out the nice way of putting this. She, she went to work for an escort service. Her job was to meet businessmen that were flying in and make sure that they had a good time. Broke my heart. This time I'm saved. We're married. Have no children. Vicky ends up getting pregnant, has a little boy. She couldn't take care of him. He came to our house for a while. It was the first time we had a, a kid, and we hadn't been married that long. But every time I would see her, I'd try to, I, I'd, I'd try to say, man, you need to straighten up. You need to straighten up. I never did tell her about Jesus. I knew the truth. And the Holy Spirit began to deal with me. You need to talk to her. You better tell her about Jesus. You need to talk to her. You better share the gospel. And each time I'd have an opportunity and I'd blow it every time. She was in and out of our life. The kid was in and out of our life constantly. She went from drugs to relationships to drugs to relationships. And, and I never shared the gospel with her. One night about 4 o'clock, well, one morning about 4 a.m., my phone rung. It was Vicky's mom. I couldn't understand what she said on the phone. She gave the phone to a police officer. A police officer asked me my name. I told him. He said, we need some help. There's a young lady in a vehicle, and she's unidentifiable. We think we know. Mom will not go in and identify, but she was T-boned in Anderson, South Carolina by a drunk driver running 130 miles an hour. And nobody in the car is identifiable. Could you help us? I said, sir, I'm an hour and something away. He said, we'll wait. We got up, got in the car. Drove to Greenville, South Carolina. Dropped Donna off with family. Get the car go down. Sure enough, it's her. <sighs> That's why this is more than a campaign to me. For the past 29 years, 
not one day, not one day goes by. Do I ask the question, was she my one? I let that one go. At night when I go to sleep, I ask the Lord. I know it's retro and maybe you think that this is my way of dealing with it. But I say, Lord, I hope in that split second, maybe, maybe she prayed. But you see, I had the answer. I knew what she needed. And the Holy Spirit had impressed on me many times to tell her what she needed. But because of fear of being rejected by her or just me being cool or I thought it was enough to take care of her kid, I thought it was enough just to be her friend. I, listen, if I really would have loved her, if I, if I really cared, I would have gotten her to Jesus at all cost. Or I would have at least shared the gospel with her. It's the least that I could do. Did I miss an opportunity? You bet I did. Now, I'm going to ask you again. This is not scripted. This is just me talking to you. Who's your one? You know who it is. You already know who it is. Not for my ego, not for your ego, but for the cause of Christ and because you don't want to go to sleep each night with the pictures of them being tormented in a literal hell, will you share the gospel with them? Will you tell them about Jesus. It would be a shame to work beside someone for 30, 40 years or to go to school with them or to go fish with them or to go riding with them or to do anything at all, whether it's your cousin or, or your neighbor. It would, be, it would be an absolute shame for them to go off into eternity and you not know that you did everything you could to get them to Jesus. Preacher, I don't like this. Listen to me. I love it and here's why. Because every day when I get up, I want to make sure that if impressed by the Lord, you hear the gospel from me. But I don't want you to have to worry about that. When now you can figure it out right now. In the next couple of months, you know who your one is. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're somebody's one. I'm going to close with that. I want you to go ahead and get us a song ready. Let's do Just As I Am, John, if you don't care. Just As I Am Without One Pity. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do today. You may be here and you're lost. You're somebody's one. You've never accepted Christ. you got the name Christian, but you're not a disciple because you've never accepted Christ. There's no fruit in your life. You know whether you're lost or not. I don't know that. It's between you and the Lord. You know that. If you don't know him today, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. You can know him and the free pardon of sin. He'll take you from a beggar who has nothing and he'll give you everything. That's who he is. Christian, you're here today and you're not telling others about Jesus. I'm asking you, who's your one? Who's the one you're going to share the gospel with? Every Sunday, I told you, I've got about six. I'm going to share a story with you on Sunday morning about someone that was my one that I should have probably no I know I should have told the story of Jesus and I didn't and now they're in eternity I don't want you to have that you say well I have to share the gospel with everybody that's exactly right and if you have to open your mouth so be it I want you to bow your head close your eyes no one's looking around before we sing before we sing you're going to stand and sing this with me here you say preacher I'm a Christian I know that I've been born again But if I'm not careful, I'm going to let my one slip right through my hands. Would you pray for me? You slip your hand up and down right now. Oh, my goodness. All over this building. Out of pride, something's stopping us from doing it. Preacher, would you pray for me? You can put your hands down. How many here today, you've never accepted Christ? You know if you died right now, you'd spend eternity lost forever. You're here today, maybe because somebody invited you. Just to sh- you came just to shut them up. But while you're here, God spoke to you. Listen to me. It's no accident you're here today. It's the providence of God. He loves you. He died for you. He'll save you today if you'll just let him. Preacher, I'm not a Christian. I'm not sure. 
Would you pray for me? You slip your hand up and down. Anywhere in the building. God bless you. Is there another one? Anywhere in the building. Preacher, I'm not a Christian. Would you pray for me? Is there another one anywhere at all? Let's all stand. As we sing, Christian, if, you need, if you're in the middle, tell them to move out of your way. You're serious today. You need God to help you today to share this. Who's my one? You make your way right now. Let's go as we sing. Come on. Amen. Don't wait. God, I thank you for those that's come forward today. Thank you for all of those that raised their hand. Father, there's no question about it. We need to be sharing the gospel. And I pray that today would be a brand new start. Say, so, well, we should have been doing this all along. We can't live on should have, could have, and would have beens. But God, all we can do is confess to you that we've not been doing it right. God, we confess that we've sinned. We've not shared the gospel, given the opportunity. God, we can also make this commitment today that if you'll help us, you'll give us courage and you'll strengthen us and you'll give us opportunity. God, we won't let the next one slide. God, we'll share the gospel with those that you put in front of us, especially that one, God, that may be closest to our heart. May we leave here today thinking about, praying about who's our one. Who's the one? Who's the one, Lord, that you'd have us to win this year? God, may it be etched in our mind and on our hearts. Give us courage and strength. God, help our motives to be what they ought to be, not for our own egos or because we can say, look at all that we've done and not so that we can grow a bigger church. And God, may our motive be just to save them from hell. Help us to be that today. Father, we're going to glorify you. We're going to praise you. We're going to thank you for all that you do. Because we ask in Jesus' name. Before I say amen, we've had some folk um, talk about joining the church. And as we're head bowed, eyes closed, continue praying, maybe God spoke to you about joining the church. Maybe you haven't talked to me yet. You can have an opportunity to do that today. But for those that's, that spoke to me about joining the church, I'm going to open the doors of the church this time. God spoke to you. Three ways you can join the church. You can join by baptism. You can join by letter from another church. Or you can join by statement of faith. That's the three ways you can join the church today. So if you spoke to me about joining, if you'll just make your way up here now, we'll go ahead and do that. This is Wayne and Johnetta Barnett. Did I get that right? All right. I practiced that one. Amen. Uh, they're coming by statement of faith today. They've been saved for a long time. Both of them have been baptized. 
And uh, man, I'm excited that they're yeah. going to come along uh, and help us on this journey that we've started here. Praise God yes. for them. Amen. Do I hear, uh, and they're joining by statement of faith, let me just say that. Is there a motion on the floor with the second members? Second motion. All right, y'all, you couldn't wait to do it. You got a second? <laughs> you got a second right here. Joe seconded it. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> I'm just giving them a fist pump for hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. All righty, folks, here's how we're going to close this thing down today. If you can get up through here, you come by and shake my brother Wayne and Janetta's hand and let them know you're going to be praying for them and let them know how thankful we are they're a part of our church. Remember, go get your one. Amen. You're at liberty to go. Amen. <laughs>